So we're discussing understanding. And the key to understanding, the term understanding, the term is a word. It is a spoken word, a written word, and a conceptualized term. So we're going to make two columns. We'll make this uh, exactly. So this is 11 inches. So half of 11 is five and a half. So four, five, right there. We'll put that there and we're going to make a line right there. Now we need to understand that understand the term has not always been around. Uh, this is, uh, I guess, future. And this is past. And this is our direction of travel. We are traveling through time. And we're not going to talk about the future right now because we're talking about the history of understanding. So we're going to put a line here, and this is going to be our present. All right. So in the present, the human species understands some things. We understand a lot of things. But in the past, like in the beginning, we'll say it's right here. Let's just go, we'll, we'll go back 6,000 years. I think that, that takes us as far back as we need to talk about understanding. Now, these two columns are um, going to be titled the, uh, the situation. And this one is going to be the process. So we got two things taken into consideration, the situation and the process. So <clears throat> we've had this historical evolution of the word and the concept of understanding. The, the concept of understanding has, last, has been around for a long time. So let's just say 6,000 years ago something happened. This realization that two humans can share symbolic sounds, spoken words, to commune common understanding. But 6,000 years ago started something else. And that was the beginning of written language. So what's important about understanding is that understanding is is an agreement. It's an agreement between two people, at least, that have communicated a common conceptualization, thought, idea. And prior to this, our cultures were organized by... So, so during this time, 6,000 years ago, pretty much everybody was pagan. The common understanding was passed down from generation to generation by dance, ritual, song, and the governance was tribal. And the leadership was chiefs. Excuse my spelling, I'm a terrible speller. I before E except after C. Chiefs? Gosh, I, I, English language doesn't come to me naturally. 
Each tribe would have variations on languages. Regions might have similarities. But all around the world, the humans sort of adopted this means of communication. They've adopted spoken words, dance, rituals. And what is observable about the evolution of, of we could say this is a type of technology, it's a tool of communication, spoken word, to, to, to come to a common understanding um, as, as the benefit to the human species. It is, is vitally important. So the spoken words um, were, were the media of the time. But beginning here was the written language, and, and that started for, for, for a long time, right up until, like, just 2,000 years ago. So 2,000 years ago, and it's kind of gray in here. We got Babylonians and Mesopotamians and uh, my favorite, the Hittites, which were around here somewhere. I like Hittites. Anyways, um... So we know a lot about them because the written word had begun. And, you know, back here there were, there were cave drawings. Um, and art. And love for life. Just as there is now. So... The very, very beginning written languages, the earliest records of actual logic written down were accounts. Who has what where in storage? Who makes what? Where does stuff come from? So the very earliest written accounts of, of communication was about, about what was important. And what was important to life was climate. Um, maintaining a comfortable climate so that the weather doesn't kill you was important so that was clothing shelter um, fire warmth uh, water fresh water where does the good water come from where's the bad water come from what's good to eat what's not good to eat and when you gather things to get through the the winter or the dry season or the migration um, when to travel all these things were, were held in these pagan dance rituals that come from the past. And then they started writing it down. When the chiefs, the elders, held the knowledge, and they passed the knowledge, or the um, understanding, the common understandings, down from generation to generation. So during this situation, there was some definitive advantages that people or human species had over the other species um, had to do with coordination, um, uh, cultural um, tradition. These sort of positive things definitely um, put the humans in a position of superiority. They were able to, to control their process better because of the common understanding. And I changed this to elders because chiefs implies a gender. And I would believe that, you know, in Mesopotamia especially, I mean, um, many cultures have, have a great respect for the maternal uh, driving factors, um, including our present one. So <clears throat> over time... The ability to write the spoken language and agree on written understandings came up to, to 2000. So there were some, some problems with this system. There were problems with this system. 
um, disease um, or vulnerability to attack if the chiefs, the elders, the people who, who, who possessed the rituals, the songs, the dances, the understandings that were to preserve the understanding and pass down were lost due to a, a battle or a sickness or a disease or attack by animal, the tribe or the community could find themselves in a position of, of losing huge chunks of, of the wisdom required for their quality of life. So there was this desire to find a better way. So they were going through a process here of, of finding this. So they'd be, they'd be, you know, writing um, pictoglyphs and different images. And the Oriental, mind you, um, I, I, I haven't mentioned them, but the Chinese cultures date back literally thousands of years. Their strength, their, their determination through history is, is something that is very impressive. And they've been isolated. They, they live on an area of, of our planet, isolated by large mountains, um, passes, and whatnot. But anyways. So, Ad 2000 <clears throat> was a very interesting time because there was something dramatic happening. There was a huge civilization that was growing exponentially. And that had to do with written word of common understanding. And at that time, I believe they knew less of what we're talking about here than I've just mentioned. Um, they were, were stuck in their present, the situation of their time, and they were doing great. They had industrial processes, they had math, they had the very beginnings of, of what has become known as the scientific understanding. There was an abundance of wealth that allowed many, many people to live in the lap of luxury, giving them a lot of time to sit and think, communicate, speak, write, experiment, and all sorts of interesting things. This was um, a Roman Empire, it was called, and there was a book that came out of here um, called A Good Book, and the idea at the time was to create one good book that held the holy, holy, or the holistic, understanding so it wouldn't be lost if all you needed to do was learn the common written language. So the media has gone from spoken to written. Now what was amazing was they could hire highly trained monks to copy the Bible. And, um, and, and this was a period of time where it wasn't really tribal anymore. It was a period of empires. And although the Roman Empire wasn't the first, it's the one I'm going to talk a lot about because basically the pickle we're in sort of has to do with that. So it was an era of empires and, um, Maybe not so much monarchies, but definitely empires. And they grew. They grew because of the, the written word on paper um, that was easily and lightly transported from place to place. It allowed them to coordinate the understanding over a broad area. And they brought into their empire through this lots of these pagan tribal um, people that, that, that were viewed as, as basically the, the gods, the savages and whatnot. And they were 
these sort of bickering little tribal dancing people looked down upon, but although they were looked down upon, they were treated with an understanding that they could learn. And they were taught these things. And over this period of time, they brought their, their means of accounting on paper, money, coins, trade, organization, hierarchy, and all these methods that allowed them to create this massive civilization that was just growing exponentially. And this little Bible here, this little work, was had a different idea. It had conceptualization that was somewhat different about how it all worked. And it sort of disrupted the situation, and there's a lot of debates about what happened there. But... Um, but this collapsed. They grew too fast. Um, these tribes that they brought in from, as, as they went up into Northern Europe, that was basically highly populated by, by, you know, scavengers running through the woods, collecting acorns for the winter and whatnot. Um, and, and lifted them up, taught them how to make roads that were nice and straight so that they could um, develop inter- inter-tribal trade and, and taught them the fundamentals. And then they lost it all. And <clears throat> between 2,000 years ago and around, so let's, 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 let's get a little measuring device out here. So about 500 years ago, so this is negative 500, was the nether, ne big leap. So this is uh, written. So this is the media. So we've gone from spoken to written. And then we went to print. Mechanical. Oh, and coincidentally, the word understanding, somebody just recently told me, but this is all about understanding. Understanding. The word understanding had to do during this medieval period, which was um, feudal um, monarchies, religious. Um, there was this period of time that was very divisive. Divisive. Yeah, I mean, it was divisive back here too during the Roman Empire too. Divisiveness is is a pretty common thing in the human species when it comes to um, comes to the process, the work. When when we start talking about this side of the column more. So during the print and the mechanical era, which started about five hundred years ago only. And back here, the common understanding was, I was talking about these people who just stood around and talked about things because they had time in the Roman Empire. And this was the philosopher, philosophers, um, natural. And they tried to make sense of, of the nature of the human species. At the beginning of this little video, I mentioned that, that for 30 years I spent trying to make sense of the human condition, and that was a complete waste of time because the term doesn't make any sense. It's completely logical if you look at making sense of the human condition. It's illogical. But philosophy is about making sense of the nature of the human species. And this, during this era of print 500 years ago, um, we, um, broke natural philosophy up into the categories of science. 
and that's quantified. And this happened between five and let's say 200 years ago. So that would be eight, nine, 10. Hey, these are tenths, okay. So that would be 200 years ago um, was when, when science as modern science really took off. So when you had the print and the mechanical, what happened is they, they started proliferating written text. So during this phase here, we had churches that held the book. And once a week, everybody would congregate and listen to the person who ministered the understanding that was written in the books a thousand years ago. And everybody, you know, feared, feared the Lord and and listened and dutifully went out, worked six days a week, and then came to the church to hear the good word. Um, but the printing press, invented by, I believe, a German. And shortly after, around the same time, there was the invention of the lathe, um, improvements in metallurgy, creating more precise mechanical equipment. Production went up. mechanization, and then 200 years was um, uh, science, so chemical science and biology, and we're talking leaps in this sort of field that uh, microbiology, micro. So this created a greater independence, and this was print. So suddenly, the cost for the word went down. It was more common, more open, more available. So as the common understanding goes through this, it becomes... Um, more available, more open, more... So here the, the, the society, the, the individuals, started reading more. And just 500 years ago, there were these people who were able to get a hold of this book. And they were to copy the book, and they were to interpret it in a different way. So here, the good book was interpreted by the clergy who ran the churches in conjunction with the uh, monarchies. So they worked together to control the word to keep the people as happy as possible. But when you reinterpret this book from a personal perspective, an introspective one from outside this little circle of mystery, you suddenly realize that it can be interpreted for your little community's benefit. You can make your own church. And that was that was revolutionary. That was the Protestant Reformation. Protestant, Protestant Reformation, which was um which was quite 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 huge. Quite huge and it, so anyways, so like just in the past 200 years, and of course, then we went to, so this was monarchies, Protestants, and right, 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 right. And then we went to, um, what did we do? Newspapers uh, was the next media type. Uh, newspaper, radio. Television, and this went right up to to when I was born, and that was the era of broadcasting. So that would be called broadcasting, which is still common, but it's dying because now there's been another leap in openness and availability. So each one of these steps. So we've gone from pagan which was a media that was spoken understandings to
to written 2,000 years ago, and this was a transition that took 2,000 years. And then we went 1,500 years to go from handwritten print uh, or text or to, to mechanically printed books. Reduce your cost. More people are able to learn how to read, realize a benefit in reading. More people are able to write their own books, make money by creating their own understandings that they share with other people. Fiction, fun. Suddenly reading became fun, not something that was religious. And then broadcasting allowed, um, came about. And see, for each change, there was also sort of a change to our political socioeconomic system. So from here, the newspaper, radio, and television sort of opened the world up more. And we got democracies. Democ no, 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 no. The democracies really grew from here. Democracies were here. Democracies and um, nations. So the national thing came out of the print media. The newspaper, we ended up with oligarchies because the big companies controlled the word. The big companies controlled the, the understanding and they would broadcast it out to lots of people. Everybody would run home to, to watch their television shows. I, I remember when I was a young boy on Sundays, we would do curling and we would go curling i think it was from 5 30. we'd eat dinner at, we'd eat dinner at five we'd run to the curling club we'd we'd curl from 5 30 until about seven and then we'd drive home really really quick so that we could watch archie bunker and the muppets anyways um so in the era of broadcasting, our political, socio-political, economic systems turned into an oligarchy and uh, capitalism, capitalism, um, capitalism started down here. Um, socialism as well. And then... And then present, what we're doing right now um, is um, the, the very, very beginning of YouTube and the WWW. And what does the future have in store for us? And that's kind of what I would like to talk about. So this, this is the evolution of, of the situation of common understandings. This is the history. We have a present moment where anybody can create their own YouTube video and say whatever they want. And it is very interesting. It is a lack of control. It's the opposite of broadcasting. It is the complete opposite. Like I can say whatever I want, like, um, gee, I don't like wearing masks in public because I like to see people's pretty faces. But, um, you know, and people can get angry at me for saying that. But that's okay. I'll wear my mask anyways. So, the process of this evolution, this is an opening of understanding. And we now have this point that we have created a huge population of people, an abundance of, of technologies, uh, an abundance of abundance. We have literally an abundance of abundance. We just got way too much of everything. Um, so the process is, is, is not hard. This was a natural, this was a natural process. I believe this was a natural process of life on earth, of evolution, and that we are fundamentally natural components of Earth's life. And everything in the past 
is the circumstance beyond control. So everything in the past is the circumstances beyond control. We can't control it. We can observe it. We can study it. We can discuss it. We can come to understandings about what's significant, what's not in the past. But we cannot control what happened in the past. We can be regretful of the things we said that caused pain to others. We can be regretful for our actions. And um, what can we do about moving into the future? And what is in the future? Well, the future, the future is actually the consequences the consequences of decision plus action plus circumstances beyond control. So, civilization's future is dependent on, and so this present line, this present moment, which is moving forward, and actually my present moment right now is in you, the viewer's past. So something might have changed. Something in your circumstances beyond control might have changed what I'm saying. So maybe this won't be true anymore, but I believe that the future of the human civilization relies on having a better understanding on what factors we need to take into consideration when deciding on action. Because we need an action. Um, it's pretty hard to deny climate change. The climate is changing very quickly, and we have known for over a hundred years that it's changing due to our activities. And this all happened like right in here, right in this time frame, right? So we're talking about people being able to talk, communicate, understand, to, to help us grow and evolve, become, improve our quality of life. And, and, and it all depends on what we do here, in this line. So, so it's all about decisions and actions. And inside this line, Is, is what's kind of critical. And we're struggling with that. I believe that we need to somehow explore ideas for our political, socio-economic systems to better adapt to this evolution of openness of, of media, media types. We've gone from spoken, to written, to print, to broadcast, to www. And this is all, like, like it, you see, the newspaper broadcasting and the www is, is in this time frame. It's just here, right? This all should stick into this little time frame, okay? So the decisions we need to make are both decisions of self, because we are each an egotistical idiot, right? Family, 
community and whole. In that order, prioritize. Because we each need to make decisions for ourselves, because freedom is important. Because freedom is important, we need to each work to be independent. Because I don't want people to suffer because I can't care for myself. So I'm working towards independence. Family is about the familiar people, friends and family. Anyways, you know what? I'm going to go into this in more detail. And and this is what I'm going to talk about in this in this video series. I mean, the decision making, the actions, we have to take in consideration the factors, the factors of consideration that determine the consequences of our actions and um, and how how do we do we steer the human civilization to a way that is conducive to a better future? So that's what I understand where we're at. So maybe the next one, I'm going to open up this line here and talk about. Next one we're going to do is perspective. So understanding is basically two people that agree. Without agreement, there is no understanding. Communication is used to come to understandings. An understanding. Yeah, the term understanding came in here. I don't think I'd said that, but the term understanding came from this medieval era when there was many people wandering. They weren't part of communities because of whatever reason. So they were wandering and living in the woods. They continued to live in the woods while there were walled cities that protected them from, from, from people who had ill intent. And these cities would have a large sign that listed the rules for their little community, their tribe, their city, their little mini civilization, their families. And the sign would have a list of the rules for that community. And there would be a couple of knights standing on either side of the sign, right at the gates, by the moat. And We were just going through this book here, and I just gave you, I wrote a few notes just to finish up this segment on understanding. So, so this understanding that I just shared was my interpretation, okay, of this book, which was H.G. Wells' interpretation. of what he understood. So I was interpreting the history as interpreted by a 19th century British um, uh, scholar uh, who was a prolific writer and and it touches on a lot of things that today we continue to struggle with such as the white fragility thing you can certainly get a sense of white fragility in here. So in the 1500s, the, the elite, the wealthy, the nobles of, of Europe had realized how important knowledge was. And they actually brought scholars from the Middle East to Europe to teach and to tutor their children. And the history of the knowledge, the seed of all these knowledges actually did come from the Middle Middle East. A lot of 
a lot of this wisdom, this knowledge, this seed of, of knowledge. Um, like Fibonacci. Fibonacci was the son of Bonacci and would travel with his father from across the Mediterranean um, when Europe was still using the Roman numeral system and they really struggled with calculations and Fibonacci was really impressed with how the merchants could so quickly calculate sums, totals, multiplication in their head almost instantly and he was just absolutely fascinated and and he was sort of held responsible for bringing the decimalization of our counting systems to to western as it's come to know, be known western western um, society and and now it's almost ironic the british are actually doing a research about the financial implications um of, of going back to the empirical system but anyways that's neither here nor there So, so our situation, the way we are right now, it has, it's changed dramatically. There was a time where you could just go into the woods. I'm quite lucky as a Canadian. Uh, if I hop my truck and head north, um, 40 minutes away from here, I can be in, in the wilderness where there's almost nobody. In the summer, kind of fills up but but this time of year there's really nobody out there and if I just drove four hours north I literally could just lose myself in the woods and nobody will find me and it's nice to to have that fringe that fringe of society where where people who feel they don't belong can get out and, and commune with nature um, it's vitally important for my sense of well-being but at the same time I have no choice but to operate within our community and that can be challenging especially now in this day and age with YouTube and this globally connected community uh, wars learning about wars just a few decades ago a couple of a couple of generations ago a few generations ago you would learn about a war that erupted on the other side of the planet in a week or two when that letter from your distant families has made it across the oceans and then the time that that has gone down has been reduced and reduced and reduced and now we have almost a live webcam on the helmet of a president of a country that's being invaded by their neighbors and they're all family like they all speak the same language it just seems so absurd to me but let's just sum up the understanding. I'd like to bring up one other thing that's important. Are we still recording here? Oh, I just realized that we don't have very good lighting. Maybe that will help. Okay, I got the lighting a little bit better. Not perfect. So I got to touch on another subject about understanding, which is critically important. And that is the Kruger-Dunn syndrome. It's an observation by two scientists, I guess you'd call them. Their names were something Kruger and something Dunn. Might have been Dunn and Kruger. It might have been Kruger and Dunn. Um, and this was about... It, it, it has to do with stupidity or ignorance, whatever you want to call it. Now, I think this has to do... And, and it's sort of an observation that, that really smart people quite often think that they're dumb, so they don't want to speak out. And then really dumb people are emboldened and think they're intelligent and they speak out. And this has to do with, with quite often our leadership seems to be people who are quite stupid. But stupid is as stupid does, you know, like... It, the movie Forrest Gump. So from my perspective, I'm just going to share you my perspective of what I understand about the world. So I, I started out and you could say that, you know, the initial people who taught me things was mom and dad. 
and they taught me a bunch of things and they're on two different branches of this branch of understanding and then there was school and then you know high school elementary school and the different uh, different things and you can and this branches out so you know this was my elementary school learning this was you know relatives neighbors so all these different people were teaching me different things. My neighbors at the time, two doors from where I grew up, there was kids who were uh, basically hippies. They, they smoked funny tobacco and, and they would babysit me when I was a kid. And as you, you learn more, right, you go out and this is the extent of what you know. You, you get what you've learned and there's stuff out here that you don't quite get yet. And there's a little bit. And then say this subject is, is math or biology and you get it. There's some, some stuff you just don't quite understand and you don't quite see. And as this, this beginning point, as you grow out and understand more and more things, there's a little bit. So when you're done school, when you finish school, you have, you know all this stuff, you've passed it, you've succeeded, and you feel that you understand everything there is in the world, and that's true. And then you, you go out into the real world and you start practicing, practicing what you learn. So when you start practicing, suddenly you go, oh, there's all this stuff out here I never even realized. So you hit the ground running after school thinking you know everything and you're just going to live your life. But then as you start working around this fringe of conceptualization, you realize that there's more and more out here. So then you go, oh, the practice is not as simple as the theory. The theoretical knowledge is, is one thing. Applying that knowledge to, to leading your life is a whole other thing. And it opens up more questions. So, so then you hit your adulthood and you go, okay, I'm going to start a business. I'm going to become part of a, a big organization. I'm going to do, I'm going to change the world. And as you, you're, you're practicing your theoretical knowledge, you end up with this other ring. And all this out here, just beyond the fringe of your understanding, is what you're working at understanding. And then you raise your family and you have kids and you're trying to explain to your kids. And then out here, there's more questions. And, and more and more and more questions. So as you, um, as you grow older, you realize that the ratio of what's known to what's unknown. So here, down here, you knew like whatever, you knew 10 things and you know that there's 11 things to understand. So this ratio of between what you know there's left to understand and what you've learned emboldens you. It gives you a feeling of confidence that you understand everything. And then you learn the 11th thing and now there's 15 things left to learn. And then once you learn, once you learn 15 things, you realize there's actually 27 things to learn. And once you learn those 27 things, you realize that there's actually, you know, 48 things, whatever. You know, I could have picked out numbers along the Fibonacci series, but, ah, well, whatever. So <clears throat> this is part of the Kruger Dunn thing. And then you reach a point in your life, just when your kids are leaving the nest, like I am experiencing right now, which is quite an interesting experience because it's halfway through my adulthood and what's going to happen next. But this also applies 
to the holistic understanding, the understanding of the whole planet, of the people, our, our community's collective understanding. Everything that we understand is exactly like this. It's, it's not really something that has an end goal. We're, we're going to keep working on it and realizing that there's more left to learn. There's always going to be more left to learn. And, um, and that, I think, sums up where the Kruger-Dunn syndrome is. And I've also shared with you most of the conceptualizations that I'm going to share to explain this moving into the future. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, like, subscribe. If you want, you can check out my Patreon account. Please contribute, support if only you find things of value in what I say. If you think what I'm saying has helped you in understanding how our world works. Um, and in retrospect, take, take a thought about what I'm thinking. Think about it for a year. And if you realize, oh yeah, there's something there, come back. Come back, like, subscribe later. Um, you don't need to right away. And um, now if you don't think there's anything of value that I'm sharing, I think it's quite important that you don't like, don't share. Even make a comment that, um, that shoots me down. Whatever. If you want to do that. Um, I really appreciate you. And uh, stay tuned. I'm going to be doing some more videos soon in my next my, me my next um, endeavor is to, to do the term perception, because that's, that's a great one. I love perception. Anyways, thanks a lot.